youth. We will kickstart this with the Wise Demo campaign. To understand more, it's our pleasure to invite Marvin Hong, who is the Vice Chairman of Hong's Group and Executive Director and CEO of Hopping Group Holdings Limited, GYLD mentor as well at the GYLD International Steering Committee member. Welcome, Marvin. We welcome you on the stage. Please. Welcome, Mr. Hong. Let's give it up for Mr. Hong. We have a few questions for Mr. Hong. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So our first question is, I mean, maybe people can understand what the WISE Demo campaign is, but just to make it clearer, we'll mention that the WISE Demo campaign is our way to engage global young leaders to focus their expertise towards addressing the SDGs. And we have multiple categories, starting from climate change and green development, poverty alleviation, innovation drive. We'll learn more about it. But Marvin, for you, the question is, why did you choose to be a mentor for the WISE Demo campaign? Uh, I think, uh, the most importantly, when I was your age, I got a mentor. You know, teaching me, you know, helping me to transverse the universe. So I think it's time for me to pay back. But I think I think we are in um in a in a time that we, we experience you know unparalleled growth. And as, at the end of the day, we are also seeing a lot of pitfalls and struggles, a lot of challenges we're facing ahead, right? So we can, you know, give kudos to the existing leadership, you know, what they have done in terms of globalization, achieving what we have today. But there's so many different challenges as we, you know, talk about, right? Climate change, you know, um, inequalities, right? Uh, crisis of different kinds and all. I think it's time for the, you know, the younger generation, you know, to pick up, you know, the pace, you know, and, and carry the torch forwards, understanding, you know, what we have done before, what the mistakes we have made, what uh, successes uh, we have done. And, um, you know, you, you guys are young kids, right? Young leaders, right? So you have a much fresher eyes to understand the perspective better. And here you go, you know, and, and um, you know, um, do it, you know, try to embrace the changes and, and face changes and lead us to a better world. Wow. Right. And uh, Marvin, uh, the 2022 GYLD Wise Demo campaign has over 100 projects, proposals being submitted, and among them, 11 were selected by the judge committee. Uh, you're a part of the committee. Share with us some of the events, some of the projects that impress you the most. Oh, I think this is just a great program. I, I see a lot of quality uh, submissions, right? I think re re what really has uh, you know captured my attention, I think there's one by Jonas, I think Jonas Wolf. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Do you yeah. him personally? Yes. Okay. We will we'll ask him to the stage uh, later on, right? Uh, I, uh, you know, wow. he, he talked about, you know, how to use, you know, a more cutting edge technology in terms of building up a platform, you know, to train uh, leaders for the future. I think that's a great idea. I think how, 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 how we not be able to leverage, uh, you know, technologies to share our knowledge and insights, right? I think that's one. And I like another one, um, I, I think nowadays, right, design thinking is very important. So I choose another one, another one about design thinking. I think uh, Elbef. Okay. Uh, I, th I think she talked about uh, sustainability using uh, uh, e-magazine, right? Yeah. Uh, to, to show, uh, you know, check and fashions about China. You know, uh, how do you em embrace uh, green technologies with this? I think this is also very amazing. No, I, I think these are very fresh ideas. Um, uh, using China as a place of melting pot, you know, to melt all ideas and, and make it make it happen, uh, you know, more substantially and concrete in the future. I, I think these, these two have really caught my really eyes. Really stand out. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll meet them very shortly right. on the stage. And Marvin, I report for the Chinese uh, political annual two sessions on a yearly basis, and I'm glad to know that you are a member of the CPPCC uh, committee, and you also advise the Beijing CPPCC committee, the political consultancy uh, body. Uh, what suggestions have you made to them in terms of supporting youth growth? Well, um, a lot of suggestions, right? Uh, um, as I'm from Hong Kong originally, so I, I talk a lot about Hong Kong youth. You know, Hong Kong is a special place, right? Um, uh, under the you know, one country, two system, there are a lot of um, things uh, in terms of the structures, uh, the ideas can be quite, quite different uh, from, from mainland China. So how do I use, we use Hong Kong and, um, and, you know, to, uh, to achieve you know, what, what we're talking about 
uh, equalities, um, substantial abilities, you know, common well-being and all, you know, within the whole of China. There's one thing that I talk about a lot, a lot. Uh, international interaction too, you know, you know, talking about interacting with other people. I think I think the younger generations, in my opinion, is even more open-minded than than our generations. So talking, you know, more continuously, you know, working with um, uh, Mabel and Henry in in program as such will be a great uh, you know platform, you know, to. Uh, better prosperity in the future. Thank, thank you. you so much, and thank you for your support as a uh, judge committee. We give a hand to Mr. Hong here. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin Hong. Now, now it is time for us to invite our VIPs who will present the prizes to the Wise Demo Campaign uh, winners. And Marvin, we would also request you to stay on the stage while we welcome Ambassador of Belgium to China. His Excellency Bruno Anglet on the stage. Welcome. We also have Deputy Head of Delegation at the International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC Regional Delegation for East Asia, Boris Kletrovic. Welcome. We'd also like to welcome Global Health Envoy of German Minister, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's also former uh, Chief the Cabinet of Dr. Tedros, Director General of the World Health Organization, Bernard Schwartlander. Welcome. We have Vice President of the Academy of Contemporary China and World Studies, Sun Ming. Welcome. And our final mentor is Vice Chairman of Beijing Returned Overseas Chinese Federation, Su Yong. Welcome. And now we will invite the winners of the Wise Demo campaign. And our first category is Poverty Reduction and Inclusive Development. Our winner is Hendi Yoniarto. Hendi Yoniarto is lecturer in Indonesian Language and Culture, School of Asian Studies at the Beijing Foreign Studies University. His project, his proposal was about China's poverty alleviation. And he is from Indonesia. And we have a representative of him on the stage. In the category of public health, the winner is Ms. Bahu Feroz. His doctor at Fuwai Hospital, Beijing, is winner of Global Health Award 2020 for excellence in cardiovascular care. His topic of proposal is COVID-19 fight and public health. He's from Bangladesh. Welcome. In our third category, climate change and green development, we have three winners. Firstly, Nafisa Mughal, PhD research scholar, international student ambassador, as well as youth activist. She proposed a topic on green development performance evaluation in the era of climate change, a novel perspective for BRICS. She is from Pakistan and has sent a representative. Welcome. Our second winner in this category is Sinia Otmakova. She is manager, ballistic architecture machine. And her proposal was mitigating the public perception of municipal waste management infrastructure through design. Sinia is from Russia, welcome. And third in the category of climate change and green development is Mohammed Shafa, assistant professor, Xi'an Jiaotong University, and the proposal was on air quality monitoring for smart city infrastructure. Mohammed Shafa is from Pakistan. For the next category, innovation drive and digital economy, the winner is Elbaz Van Paradam. She is Sinologist, editorial consultant with Beijing Review and Funder, editing chief of the China Temper. She's from, uh, she top, topic, her topic of proposal is China through the lens of fashion and urban culture. She's from the Netherlands and represented by a colleague. And next is Jonas, Jonas Wolf is founder and CEO of Lead Our Ship. The topic of the research is next generation change maker by Lead Our Ship for GYLD and uh, Jonas from Germany and represented by a colleague. In our next category, open cooperation and interconnectivity. Our first winner is Dotsenko Anna. 
who is Huangpu International Innovation Institute's project manager. And the proposal was bridging China and the world, strong with innovation and culture. Dotsenko is from Russia. Our second winner is Mostak Ahmed Talib, a foreign teacher of Wuhan University of Technology, whose proposal was on the Padma multi-purpose bridge, a tale of shared future. Mostak is from Bangladesh. Next winner is Shikha Tapa Maga, project manager of Scholar Network. The research mo is model SEO, learning empathy through Shanghai spirit. She's from Nepal. The next winner is Ifi Zwilin Michael Michel Omolui, Associate Professor and Executive Director of the Center for Nigerian Studies and Institute of African Studies, Zhejiang Normal University. The proposal is development of dividends among the Belt and Road Initiative countries in Africa, who is from Nigeria. Congratulations to all the winners. Let's give them a warm round of applause. This was hard work. Thank you. And the ones who couldn't make it have have sent their friends or representative to to receive this prize and we warmly congratulate all of you. Now let's have the official prize distribution. Let's hand the certificates to the mentors and then they will pass them on to our winners. And we will then pose for a group photo. Yes, please. I'll get it next time. Congratulations. And as you can see, really, these young leaders are from different professions, different countries all over the world and their proposals really aimed at making a positive impact in the world. So we warmly congratulate them and wish them all the best. And we do see a great diversity here. As you mentioned, Zuri, they were from over 60 countries and regions from the world. Yeah. They're all young people. Now we'll step aside. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. And congratulations. Congratulations once for again. For your commitment and dedication. Thank you. Next, we'll proceed to GYLD talk. It's supposed to be very yeah. good. It's one of the key events of the day where we'll see the insights and experience for our young winners. Absolutely. Who have demonstrated their leadership in their work. So let's invite, without further ado, in our first category on wisdom of youth, our first speaker is Alfredo Montefar Helu Geminis. And Alfredo will talk about uh, addressing the global communication deficit. He is head of the China Center for Economics and Business at the Conference Board. 
Alfredo, welcome. Let's welcome him warmly. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. You know what? According to the 2023 SDG progress report by the United Nations that they just released last week, progress on over half of the targets that must be met to achieve the 2030 agenda is weak. For 30% of the targets, progress has stalled or gone into reverse. Now, there are several reasons why. The most important being, of course, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, because it exacerbated the structural imbalances across economies, leading to a rise in poverty, in unemployment, debt levels, wealth inequality, and also to a deterioration of global health. There is also climate change, and we have been living through its consequences over the past weeks. I think it is no exaggeration to say that we have seen more inclement weather and more natural disasters over the past few years when compared to the last decades. But you see, the most important reason, in my view, is that the world is suffering from a severe case of communication deficit, which is at the same time a symptom and a driver of the deterioration of the geopolitical environment. Tensions and conflicts between and within nations are rising, leading to the unfortunate loss of human life and making it harder for governments to come together to find solutions for the global challenges we are facing. Challenges that do not care about national borders or about politics or about ideologies and certainly not about political systems. So when I think about the role that the younger generations can play to contribute to sustainable development, it has to be first and foremost overcoming the communication deficit that is disrupting global governance. But how to do this? In my role as the head of the China Center for Economics and Business, I dedicate a large part of my time every day to addressing communication and understanding gaps. I do this internally with my team because being a Mexican citizen, leading a global think tank in China, well, as you can imagine, there is just no shortage of different opinions. But my task is to lead my team to success. So therefore, communication is key. Together with my team, we work together to address understanding gaps, communication gaps externally, especially between China and the world. And we do this through objective and rigorous impartial analysis that is cognizant and respectful of the socioeconomic, cultural, and political particularities of different countries. So when I think about my experience, I would pose three recommendations for the younger generations to address this global communication deficit. First, you don't have to hear, you have to listen, and you have to listen very carefully. Second, if you're willing to listen carefully to other opinions, that's good, but it is not enough. You have to acknowledge them, recognize that different people think differently and seek to understand why. And finally, if you listen carefully and if you acknowledge other people's views, then you can generate consensus. And consensus builds trust. It creates ownership, builds empowerment and instills commitment. And this is precisely what we need if the world is to achieve its global development agenda. Thank you. Well done, Alfredo. I, I really admire what you said. Global challenges do not care about national borders. They do not care about political divergence or ideology. If the current leaders of the world do not want to talk to each other, at least the young people should. Absolutely. So when they come become in power, they may make their impact and play a different game. Yeah, which is why they're not just the future, they're also the present. They matter. Yeah, great. So let's welcome our next speaker of GYLD Talk, Koyan Smits, scholar of Yangqing Academy, Peking University. The topic would be US-China academic relations, the importance of exchanges. Please welcome Paul. Welcome.
To the start of the pandemic, one hundred thousand fewer Chinese students are studying in the United States. Similarly, only about four hundred Americans are currently studying in China. Programs to study on either side are being underfunded or rapidly being cut. An important example being the Fulbright program to Hong Kong SAR, which scholars from both sides of the Pacific got to reinstate. What will happen when these exchanges continue to drop further? When the when these exchanges continue to drop further, when Americans and Chinese will practically only meet to happen at the negotiation table. In September 2022, I had the privilege of being amongst the very first foreign students to study again in China. My studies of, start, of China started over a year before that, to a virtual exchange semester with Peking University. I love my studies at Beida so much that I applied as well to do my graduate studies there, specifically at the Yenxing Academy. The program which brought me to China and here to you today. Throughout my past year in China, there is so much I've learned that no textbook, paper, or lecture could ever have taught me. These things I've learned through experiencing for myself the differences in the souls of cities, such as Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Chengdu, and Sanya, taking a Gautia all the way from Hong Kong to Beijing and all the friendships I've built along this journey. These things become impossible as US-China relations, especially academic ones, continue to deteriorate. And it's therefore that I as a Dutch citizen give this speech and am passionate about my research on historical and contemporary US-China relations. From my interviewees, for my podcast, China Hands, and my research on US-China relations, I learned as well that they have the exact same. That for them, coming to China in 1979 also taught them so many things that their program in the US could never have taught them. And it, therefore, I think it's key that we continue these exchanges. And there's three lessons I wish to share with you from my research. Firstly, it is key that, United, that citizens from the US continue to study in China, and citizens from China continue to study in the US. Secondly, sorry. <laughs> uh, secondly, improving such relations will require both sides to make compromises with deep consideration for the needs, wants, and cultural differences of the other side. Lastly, I want to say how key it is for Americans to study in China as well. And I hope me sharing my story with you today illustrates that to you. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you so Colleen. much. Yeah. yeah. Thank Zun, you. I also know that you're a prestigious students from Tsinghua. Huh? Yes, and it is. I mean, but it's true that you know, as uh, foreigners, we are very lucky to get the kind of exposure that, like Coin also mentioned, Beida uh, gave, and for me at Tsinghua. And I think I'll just mention, you know, we say wisdom of youth. This is a wisdom of youth category because uh, uh, the power as well, right? But the wisdom is that you are able to find new paths, be creative, and find commonalities where they're hard to. So thank you for your inspiring talk. Yeah. Colin mentioned that there are much fewer American students studying in China than Chinese students studying in America. Yeah. And I had some experience in the UK and the US. Mm. I'm confident to say that I've known more than the Western world, than the Western world, common people know about China. At least I speak their language. Yeah. yeah. So in the Chinese uh, old saying, "百闻不如一见," hearing a story a hundred times is, is uh, not as good as uh, experiencing for yourself for even once. That's what uh, we CGTN is trying to do: telling Chinese stories, but also at the same time inviting our foreign guests to come to see it for yourself mm. in China. And that's what also yeah. CCG has been to boosting communication between the East and West and trying to ask our foreign decision makers and common people, youth leaders from the West to visit China, to work in China, to do anything in China to experience for yourself, to mitigate uh, the conflicts, to, Absolutely. To, to, to tackle the challenges we're facing together. And that's why GYLD is a platform where youth from all over the world, including China and other parts of the world, can make an impact. So thank you for your inspiring talk. Next category is China's story and the voice of youth. And our first speaker in this category is Michael Huang, who is co-founder of the X Museum. Michael, welcome on the stage. Let's, let's warmly welcome him. OK. 
Hi everyone and hi everyone online. Uh, thanks to the GYLD and CCG organizations for giving me a platform uh, to showcase you X Museum and also a platform for global cultural exchange and making a voice for Chinese art in the global art world. Oh, sorry. Okay, go back. This page can next page. Okay. Um, X Museum uh, is at the fourth, uh, at the front of showcasing the future. Uh, X Museum was born in the digital age, a time full of infinite possibilities and boundary breaking innovations. Uh, in this internet age, has allowed uh, for correlation between Eastern as we and Western aesthetics, and also um, we can become a representation uh, of the Z generation. And this is, as you can see, our space uh, in Beijing. Uh, at X Museum, you witness art as a language of international exchange, uh, bridging gaps of geography, age, gender, race, and reality. Uh, art should be inclusive, and we provide a platform for young people, women, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities, and artists of the new digital age through a series of exhibition and programs. Uh, the first exhibition at our new space in Beijing we uh, is a is a collection show of all the pink works in our collection. So the title is called X Pink One Hundred One. Uh, it's an exhibition highlighting a di diverse cultural patterns of our times. Um, we have uh, this exhibition brings together 49 works of international and domestic artists from our museum collection, uh, including some of the most known uh, young global artists of today, like Nicholas Party, Christina Qualles, and also some of the best uh, Chinese talents like Zhang Ziqiao, Ji Xing. So we really hope, uh, you know, by bringing artists all over the past century and from 17 countries and regions, we can really uh, make Chinese artists a part of the global conversation and not feel uh, discluded uh, from the global um, global attention. And at X Museum, we also have the message, uh, art is for everyone and everywhere. So during last year, during the pandemic, uh, we have done a few initiatives to bring art um, to be seen by the more public and globally, even though uh, exhibition cannot be held at the time. So on the left of the PPT um, is uh, our X Mobile Museum project. So where we host uh, a, uh, artwork, art created by Chinese artist Tong Kun Niao, uh, using discarded materials uh, to be placed in a, uh, in a van. Uh, this van is parked in San Litun underground garage, offering a free exhibition accessible to all. Uh, visitors can also participate by bringing old items, which the artist transforms into new creations. Contributors are recognized as co-curators, with their names featured on the exhibition signature, uh, forcing uh, for, for, a collaborative journey from old items to artwork in artistic ex exploration. And on the right, last year, we are honored to have Chinese male tennis player Wei Bing as our international ambassador, showcasing uh, artwork in our collection by the uh, Chinese New Ink Art Master Xu Lei. Uh, this work is also selected for the Venice Biennial uh, to be in the Chinese pavilion. So uh, by printing this artwork on uh, Wu Bing Sports uh, jersey, presenting them as a medium to the global audience. So this is precisely what X Museum aims to achieve, breaking boundaries through the power of art and collectively creating a better world. Art is for everyone and everyone can participate in the creation and the appreciation of art. Thank you. Oh, sorry, not finished. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at X Museum, we believe uh, exhibiting the future and focusing on the now. So we hope 50 years later, X Museum will become a micro a microcosm of our era, witnessing a fusion of love and beauty, 
And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's great that young people are presenting art for young people. I think for young people to walk into a museum, sometimes it's a bit heavy for them to watch those traditional art, like oil painting or sculpture, you know, those yeah. were great art, but young people might, may find it a bit distant to them yeah. with those, uh, you know, too heavy detailed, you know, craftsmanship and young people may appreciate those digital products. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we have that opportunity. And I yeah. think the best thing about digital products is that it they can bring art, history, perspective closer to people um, in different parts of the world. So definitely, thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Shuhei Oyama, co-founder of Blue Architecture Studio, the civil award winner of the 2016 Architecture Creation Awards, Architectural Society of China. And the topic of uh, the speech is Architecturing of the Future, Embracing Youthful Styles and Urban Evolution. Welcome to stage. Welcome. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Xu Hei. Uh, I'm an architect uh, from Japan, living in Beijing, uh, but uh, I'm doing my presentation in Chinese, sorry. Uh, I am an architect, I'm working in Beijing. According to my observation, you know, I have been following the changes in the lifestyle in different cities and what will be changing in the future architecture. That is what I'm interested in. So today, I would like to use some uh, cases, some uh, project designs to share with you this important point, that is the young people are changing today's architecture and uh, that's contributing to the emergence of future architecture. First, uh, the young people are changing the traditional mode. We know that in the past uh, decades, we had a lot of two-room or three-room departments or two parents and a child. That was a kind of residential architecture we saw in the past. But what is interesting now, we have some new family styles, for example, single member family. And so that is why we designed this uh, young people sharing community. Each one's room has been changed into the mobile cubes and that they can live together, work together, create together and grow together. So this model has changed the traditional privacy and closeness of the traditional architecture. So the new demand for lifestyle has been changing the traditional house or our traditional sense of house. And second, the young people are changing the relationship between cities and architecture at a sh small Shanghai cafe. Before the changes, it was uh, totally in line with uh, the environment. But after the renovation, we have turned it into a totally open space. The young people just love sitting here, which is uh, a very open space, this new attitude, this new experience of the new space is changing the urban space so that the urban space will become more interactive and friendly and humanistic. Third, the young people are creating possibilities for future space. The internet, mobile phones, AI, big data, and other new technologies have made our life more convenient, and such virtual spaces have become better developed. We can work here, take classes here, go shopping here, and socialize here, and we can finish all our daily functions in those virtual spaces. So architecture and uh, cities, which are physical spaces, probably are not that significant as they were before. So we need to rethink about it. In the future, what will be the value of such physical spaces? And uh, 
what the architects can do to provide better values. So this is uh, something we have done totally manually without the support of computers. Such a coarse sense of craftsmanship has brought the presence to the space. So that is the experience we want to bring to the users. So I think the young people are experiencing the fresh lifestyle and the new values. So they have a new demand for architecture and cities, which is totally changing the architecture and cities. And in the future, they will contribute to the emergence of new architecture and new cities. I'm an architect, and I'm honored to be involved in this process. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity and this platform to work together with all of the young people to create the future cities and the future architectures. So we are all looking forward to all the possibilities of future architectures and cities. Thank you. And that your effort in connecting, servicing Chinese customers is a great effort. Yeah. And that at such a young age, he's already won a major award, uh, shows his talent. It's true that he speaks about uh, young people yeah. are requiring different decoration styles, different architectures. Now it's true mm -hmm. on the market because I'm decorating my home. When I visit those uh, uh, those decoration shops, talk to designers, they say, "Oh, we do not use those French, or American, or Italian st styles." Now, you know, with due respect to those styles, the Japanese styles or Eastern Asian styles are trending because yeah. they're using high quality materials. They're very plain but very diversified. They're using high quality fibers and silks and wood to decorate with the, you know, very plain color, yeah. very close to the Chinese appreciation of mm. art, like Taoism yeah. or Buddhism. It's, it's really good. So Definitely. Really appreciate that. Although I personally, I'm a bit of a maximalist when it comes to decor. However, I think one of the best things about um, this art style is that it's peaceful, it's engaging, and it's inclusive, as also demonstrated by the example of that cafe in Shanghai. Up next, our next speaker in this category is Bora Schnittman. Sorry. Yes. Yes, yes. Bora Schnittman. Okay, Vice President of Destination Marketing at Dragon Trail International. Bora will talk about fostering cultural bridges, strengthening Sino-Israeli connections through curiosity and understanding. Welcome. Bora. Welcome, Bora. Good morning, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start by asking you a question. What was your favorite subject in school? Something you were passionate about? And what impact it had on your life? I was always a fan of geography. This is the subject I received my best grades in school. And my parents were very proud of me. They thought their son is going to be the next Marco Polo. And here I am, still trying to keep their hope alive. When I was a teenager, I could look at the maps for a long time, learn about different countries and people. And the big country in the East always seemed to be mysterious. One day, I had my own little discovery. I found out that in the end of 16th century, approximately at the same time, in two different places in the world, two world maps were created. One in Europe placed Jerusalem in the center of the world map. The second one in China, created by Matteo Ricci and presented to Ming Emperor, placed China in the center of the world. And back then I thought perhaps those two places are quite important and unique. And as I start to show more interest, I realized there's so much more I don't know. In China, Israel is quite famous for its technology, innovation, history. But in my school, we didn't learn much about China or East Asia. 
So to satisfy my curiosity, I decided to go and study about different countries, international relations, and especially about China. It was exciting to get to know the country's history and culture and practice the Chinese characters and find similarities, but mostly differences. It was even more exciting to come and visit China after my graduation and to travel around this beautiful country. You'll probably all agree that travel provides us an opportunity to communicate. For me personally, it's a tool to understand the world we live in. Shaking hand with a new friend, sharing meal with strangers, basically observing the world around us with our own eyes using all our senses to connect to the environment we are in. And this year, more than ever, we need those type of exchanges. We need to leverage the human and technological resources we have to create better connections. I've been working in uh, tourism and culture industries for more than 15 years now. And recently I, uh, I realized that perhaps one of my main life purposes is to help to na narrow this uh, gap between China and other countries. To introduce Chinese heritage to partners overseas, to communicate foreign cultural values to the audience in China, and basically to create channels to tell the authentic story, to build trust and sympathy, and to avoid hostility and judgment. Many of you probably know that uh, Jewish and Chinese people have quite a few things in common. Both people have a long history and have uh, traditional cultural values. And we also actually share some modern similarities. Both Israelis and Chinese like to travel a lot, settle down in places far away from home, being entrepreneurs, have a sense of community, and many more. And one of my favorite ones is curiosity. Since I've been in China, I received many questions from Chinese friends, and many times I couldn't even answer them. And I also received many positive comments. And back then I thought, maybe China is one of the best places in the world to be if you're an Israeli. In Israel, we also have uh, a culture of asking questions. Asking the right question, as you can imagine, will lead to solution. And maybe that's one of the reasons that Israel considered to be one of the most innovative countries in the world. During my work, I found out that many Chinese people, more and more Chinese people want to visit Israel, to explore this country, to learn about its history and innovation. And both governments made great efforts to create favorable visa policies, open direct flights, and basically showed willingness to connect. And pandemic brought many challenges to our lives. And in my opinion, one of the major challenges was the distance it created between people. And this year, we have an opportunity not only to reestablish this connection, but to make it stronger to knock aside the differences and to build upon our similarities. Now, remember the question I asked at the beginning about passion and subject. So imagine if that childhood passion of yours would make, make an impact not only on your life, but also on lives of others. What difference will it make? Thank you. Thank you, Bora. Thank you. Thank you, Bora. Indeed, uh, cultural ties and finding commonalities is very important. Next category is our shared destiny and power of use. The first speaker is Olesia Markova, is curator of a scholar network Beijing Hub, and her topic would be Sue Grain, stitching a sustainable shift and consumer choice. Welcome to the stage. Welcome. Let's welcome her warmly.
Uh, yeah, hello, dear participants and guests of the GYLD annual forum. Uh, my name is Alessia, and I'm a chief marketing officer at Scholar. Uh, but today, I won't be talking about media and marketing. I will be talking about our daily efforts we can make on the way to sustainable development and having a more greener world. And uh, now, I would like you all to look at this picture and try to guess uh, what it is. No one knows, probably, yeah. Uh, this is the jar, this is the trash produced by one family of four people, here they are, and the dog within one year. This woman in the photo is B. Johnson, and she is the initiator of the global zero waste movement. Uh, the Johnson family lives in California, and uh, the, their mom, Bea Johnson, guided her whole family to become as close to zero waste lifestyle as possible. And the whole family is on that journey for already 15 years. And in 2017, you can see the pictures here, she also visited China and encouraged as many people as possible to try living a zero waste lifestyle. And now, uh, look at me. Uh, do you know how my blouse uh, looked like before? Probably no one knows. <laughs> yeah, it looked exactly like that. Yeah, and do you know how my skirt looked like before? Uh, I didn't get the pictures here, but uh, I made these uh, new clothes from the old ones. And now they look uh, much better, right? <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> yeah. And... Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Uh, um, I enjoyed sewing for almost 14 years of my life, uh, uh, yeah, which is uh, literally half, half of my life. And, uh, but not everyone has to sew in order to reduce waste. And here, for example, you can see the pictures of the uh, bags I also made from the old clothes. And I spent for this just one hour and everyone can make just the same. Uh, because like the waste is enormous and uh, annually 500 billion plastic bags are used every year worldwide. And one million plastic bags are used every minute. And by my assumption and estimation, I just have three bags like that. I already managed to save and to replace this eight, about 800 plastic bags. And this is my little impact on the sustainable development. And this waste was just not created. And we make conscious decisions and choices about our education, which university to attend, and which major to apply for, which industry and company to work for. But why don't we make the same conscious decisions when it comes to consumption and buying? And how do we even make these choices? And are these choices made by ourselves or are they made by companies instead of us? Yeah, and that uh, research says that 95% of buying decisions are made on an unconscious level. It means that we probably even didn't want the thing we bought like a couple of weeks ago, like two days ago, yesterday, or even today morning. And our common issue is that we are always waiting for someone to come and solve our issues, be it either government, businesses, companies, uh, other members of society. But I believe that the solution lies in us and the change starts from us and our daily decisions have the accumulative power when we repeat them every day. Today, you haven't wasted one plastic cup, cap. Uh, maybe like tomorrow it's already like several and in one year it would be thousands. And it's always better to have like 100 people who are trying a little bit every day to live a zero waste lifestyle than just to have one person who is perfect in zero waste. And more isn't necessarily a good thing. And by refusing, by refusing from what we don't need, uh, we can start to value what we already have uh, much more. Yeah, and thank you so much and hope that everyone could uh, join this movement even for a little bit every day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Every day, a little bit of work. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. And now we have the last speaker of the GYLD talk in the category China Story and the Voice of uh, China's shared destiny and the power of youth. Uh, and our last speaker has sent a video. It is Abdullah al Batish, who is assistant to the Egyptian Minister of Youth and Sports. And he will talk about the power of youth and shared future. Please look at the screen. Let's watch. Zhao Kwa Yin Dasya, Hin Gao Xin Xin Dao Nimen. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, young leaders from all over the world. My name is Dr. Abdullah Batish, Assistant Minister of Youth and Sports for Youth Policy and Development at the Egyptian Ministry of Youth and Sports. It is a great honor for me to be here today, and I'm pleased to extend on behalf of the government and people of Egypt my sincere thanks and appreciation to the President, government, and people of China for inviting Egypt as a guest of the Global Young Leader Dialogue Annual Forum. And I would like to congratulate Mr. Wang, head of the Center for China and the Globalization, and his staff for holding the second edition of the GYLD, which is an important platform for global youth, a bridge of communication, and the tool for promoting youth diplomacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to point out that Egypt attached great importance to dialogue with young people and gave them a platform for expressing their needs and interests as a focal point for raising the voices of young people through informal dialogue and supporting their aspiration by increasing their participation in policy and decision making and exploring new ways to promote youth development at all levels. That appeared by announcing 2016 as the year of Egyptian youth, organizing a series of youth conferences under auspices of His Excellency, President of Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, launching the National Youth Strategy 2022 to 2027 as a roadmap for the requirements and needs of Egyptian youth for the next five years. Additionally, President al-Sisi urged the promotion and empowerment of the youth's rule on a global level, this would help integrate them with the world's youth through the World Youth Forum, which was already held four times. And the fourth edition that held the 2022, we were very pleased with the participation of the CCG. The World Youth Forum launched as a platform bringing youth from around the world together with the decision makers and different influential officials the forum became one of the most important global dialogue platforms that supporting young people for the implementation of the SDGs and the chance to engage with top policymakers in the world and network with promising youth in the world that are determined to create change in the world we live in today. In this regard, I would like to mention that China's experience in empowering and integrating young people globally deserves to be acknowledged. China enjoyed the second largest number of young people worldwide. China's work relying on young people and harnessing the demographic dividend. Led by President Xi Jinping, China launched several initiatives and the Youth Development Plan 2016 to 2025 with clear goals and integrated plans dealing with areas of youth life and the white paper on China's youth in the new era and called on young people around the world to contribute jointly to global development and seek a better future for all. So, the same objectives of the GYLD to build a youth society that seeks to cooperate, peace and promote sustainable development in the world met with the goals of the World Youth Forum, which Egypt organizes annually under the auspices of His Excellency, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, President of Egypt. Actually, we are very pleased that organization of this forum in its second edition and our invitation to participate in it with Egypt and China's celebration of 66th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries, especially at the time when bilateral relations between the two countries are witnessing a golden age in light of the friendship between the two leaders, President of Egypt and the President of China. Ladies and gentlemen, young leaders from all over the world, I hope that we will see the GYLD as an opportunity to strengthen communication, coordination and action on the forum's recommendations hand in hand, and to make joint efforts to promote peace, development and cooperation so that we can move together towards a better future. Wishing the forum full success. Shia Shia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Abdullah al -Batish. And with that, we conclude 2023 GYLD talk. Our three categories encompass speakers from all parts of the world who shared their inspiring stories. Up next, we have the plenary one of today's forum. And the plenary one's title is A New Era of Cross-Cultural Communication and the Role of Audio-Visual Media. And I would warmly like to invite Shu Hai Yu, Deputy Secretary General of CCG, to host the panel. Please come up on stage. Let's welcome. <laughs> 